I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 103. At the school, I teach Old Testament, Bible interpretation, and evangelism. And this psalm has meant so much to me through the years. I, I want to share with you out of the overflow that, that God has touched my heart in this psalm. Now, this is one of the few psalms that comes in pairs. Uh, if you'll notice, the way that Psalm 103 begins is exactly the way Psalm 104 begins. You know, in Old Testament study, there has been a, a lot of controversy the last hundred or so years over exactly how the first five books of the Bible were written. How did we get them? And uh, in the 18th century, some scholars in Europe and in America said that, uh, that Genesis has uh, two different creation accounts. Genesis 1 uses the name Elohim, and Genesis 2 uses the name Yahweh, and that's two different authors. But I want to show you in this pair of Psalms right here, the rabbis say that these do not reflect separate authors, but that these two names for God represent different characteristics of the one true God. In 104, if you'll notice in the second line, it's the word capital G God, which is this word Elohim, which is always used for God as creator, sustainer, provider. And if you look at this psalm, it's a praise about creation. But Psalms 103 in the first line and in, this, in verse 2 uses the word in your translation, it'll be all capital, Lord. And that's this word Yahweh from the verb to be. This is the name uniquely reserved to the covenant God of Israel, the God of redemption, the Savior. And if, if you look at 103, it talks about God in forgiveness and redemption. I don't think there's multiple authors in the Pentateuch. I think we're talking about different characteristics of God. And this psalm beautifully expresses uh, that very truth. I love the way this starts. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. I used to have a, a staff member. Matter of fact, Don, it was the music minister's wife who every time we'd go to El Chico's. Now, everybody knows you don't pray until after you eat the chips and dip, right? Nobody prays then. You wait till the food comes. But this lady was a stickler. And every time we would eat the chips, she would always look at us and say, <laughs> you didn't pray. <laughs> All right. So this is the prayer we would always ask her to pray. We call this a post-gastric prayer. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. <laughs> That's really not what he's talking about, it, but, um, <laughs> oh my. Well, I hope Debbie's still eating at El Chico's and uh, still praying this prayer. This is talking about all that I am, everything that I am, praise God because of who he is. And beginning in verse 2 and down through verse 5 is a series of things that we want to praise God for. And that's what I want to think about this morning. You know, sometimes I think we get this tunnel vision. We get this, oh my, what's happening to me? I think we need to widen this out to recognize our unbelievable blessings. The fact that you're here. The fact that you wanted to be here. The fact that you know that your uh, eternal redemption is secure in the finished work of Christ. The fact that you know that God is with you. The fact that you can pray to him anytime about anything. And on and on and on we could go. And I sometimes think the things that we become accustomed to, we take for granted. Listen to the series of verbs through here. It talks about, and forget none of his benefits. I always think of Deuteronomy 8, where, where I think Moses said, uh, be careful. Once you get in the promised land, once you have flocks and herds, once your gold and silver multiplies and you say to yourself, look at all that I have done. Don't you forget, it's the Lord your God that gave you the ability to make wealth. It's the Lord your God who provided all this for you. And I think we need to remember that. In, in a world like ours, it's very important that Christians remember who they are and that everything they have belongs to him. We are owners of nothing and stewards of everything. Amen? It talks about that pardons our iniquities and heals all your diseases. I want to take a, a bit of a theological uh, digression here just to say to you, I, I'm, 
I'm becoming more and more distressed of the theology that I hear on television. It's the theology that says that whatever man dreams and wants and prays about and has enough faith, he can have. And we can have instant healing of all of our problems and we can have instant wealth and we can have instant prosperity and we can have instant wholeness if we just believe enough and pray enough and, and just hang in there. That's not true. I want you to know the longer I live and the more I know my Bible, the more that people say that my spiritual success or my spiritual life depends on me, the more nervous I am about that theology. I do not control God in this area of healing. I do not believe we're promised physical healing in the atonement. When will we ever die? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Israel is described as a person with whelps from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. She is, she is described as a person with wounds that can't be cured. Diseases is a metaphor for sins in the Old Testament. There's no way we can proof text this and say that God wants to heal us of every problem. What amazes me is that Christians forget that the things that we suffer are the very mechanisms that make us strong Christians. Hebrews 5, 8 says that the things that Jesus suffered is what made him mature. You mean that Jesus needed, in his, in his human nature anyway, to struggle against problems and, and rejection to become all that God wanted him to be? Yes. And there are many times that physical problems, I don't think they're sent by God, but I think they're allowed by God. Let me ask you, do you grow closer to God in times of prosperity and abundance and peace, or do you go, grow closer to God in times of problems and stress and pain and loss? When do you pray the most? When do you trust the most? And I certainly don't believe that what I pray for is what I think the worst thing that God could do to most of us is answer our prayers. Because we're praying for all the wrong stuff. We're praying for all this me stuff and more stuff. Disaster for us. No, no, I think this is a Hebrew parallelism. You can't interpret the Psalms without recognizing that they are written in, in, in a parallel form. Now, Hebrew poetry is not a poetry of rhyme. It's a poetry of thought. And, and throughout the, uh, these, this poetry section, you have the, this parallelism. And I, I really think that what we have here is that pardons and heals are exactly the same thing. Now, I am really not a counselor type. I, I am really a Bible teacher type. But as a pastor through the years, I, I do counseling. And it's always amazed me the number of people I talk to that seem to never be able to forgive themselves. I think one of the real plagues of the people of God is that they don't feel worthy of being loved because of something they've done and they reject God's peace and happiness and presence because of some sense of unworthiness on their part. Well, join the club. Which one of us would say we're worthy of the love of God? Which one of us say we've merit God's love? No, 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 no. I submit to you that most people carry the past like a ball and chain on a prisoner's feet. Something has happened. Somebody has hurt you. Some, you've hurt somebody. You've done something. Something's been done to you. And God help us, we never can leave it in the past. It always affects us. We're always worried about it. I think... The Bible teaches that when we, when we ask God to forgive, he will. I, I, if I could paraphrase what God must think, when we, as his children, keep asking him to forgive us of whatever this is, over and over and over, I think he must say, for what? For what? If it's gone, it's gone. And I do believe that when God forgives, God forgets. Now, I want to I wanna run a few verses with you on that. I hope you get your pencil out. <laughs> it's the teacher in me. No test, just, just the pencil. And I want to start right here in this very psalm. I, I want you to drop down for a moment to about uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. 
Notice, what, notice these beautiful sit, uh, series of metaphors. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his uh, covenant love toward those who respect or fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Would you turn with me just, to a, just a moment to the book of Isaiah? I want you to see these in your own Bible so you'll know for certain I'm not making this up some way. Let's go to Isaiah 118. In the midst of Israel's continuing sin and continuing rebellion, notice what, what it says. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. My goodness, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, promise of forgiveness. Will you turn to a verse, uh, chapter 38, verse 17? 38, 17, down toward the last. Thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Would you turn over to uh, chapter 43, 25? Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Chapter 44, verse 22. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. <laughs> now, I don't know what you've done. I don't know what is bothering you about the past. I don't know what failure you feel like you have, uh, have uh, somehow participated in, but I want you to know this, that God sent his son to deal with a sin problem, that the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins, that 1 John 1, 9 says, if you'll confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. My friends, you've got to let the past go. You've got to let it go. All it does is cloud the present. We have no way to affect the past. It's gone. It's over. It's in the hand of God. Now, the other kind of a person that I've met in these counseling sessions is the what if, maybe, could be, if only, possibly, my horoscope said, I stepped on, a, on the sidewalk crack this morning, and y you know what that means. It's just always worried about tomorrow. Maybe I can't hold up. Maybe I'm going to fail. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Friends, if you live in the maybes, you're going to be miserable. Maybes never have a faith basis. You don't control tomorrow. You don't control the past. All you have is the now. And we live in the now with a God that loves us and is willing to work with sinful people. I heard people say in my life, well, God can only use a cleansed vessel. What a bunch of garbage that is. Show me a clean vessel. Show me one. And five minutes later, I'll show you a broke one. God doesn't have clean vessels. He has healed vessels. He has forgiven vessels. I like the, I like the little, little cliche that says, God hits a pretty good lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> That's all he's got. You know, I sometimes think people kind of keep the Bible at hand's length, kind of just keep it off of them by saying, well, the Bible's for spiritual people. It's for holy people. Everybody but Jesus in the Bible is a jerk. Moses is a jerk. Abraham's a jerk. Just look at the, the Bible presents men, warts and all, and there are no perfect men except one. No, the Bible's for you. Forgiveness is for you. If God will work with Israel, God will work with you. If God can use a man like David in the midst of the sin that he committed, God can use you. You just got to get on with it. You just got to get over it. You just got to let the past be the past. Let God have the future. And you worry about living for Christ in joy today. Amen? If you ask him to forgive you, he'll do it. Our problem is we wait to a revival or some emotional experience. If you feel like that you've violated what God wants you to do, tell him repent, and let's get on with it. Oh my, do I love to preach on the forgiveness of God. You say, but I'm so unworthy. I'm, such, I'm, I'm just so terrible. Join the club. It's called the human race. No, no, my friends, we're all in this together. We all live in Romans 7. 
We all know what's right and do what's wrong. We all have lapses. We all have those things. We've got to give them to the Lord, and we've got to get on with it. And when God forgives, God forgets. God forgets. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with covenant love and compassion. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Oh, to know God, the joy, the peace. Mm. Verses 6 through 8 is really about what God has done to Israel, how he has walked with them and dealt with them in the midst of all their sin, of all their rebellion. He continued to deal with them. Look at verse 8. Well, let me, let me look at verse 9 first, because I've heard this preach, I think, in, in unfortunate ways. He will not always strive with us. I've heard that presented, that if you, uh, if you say no to God, that God will leave you, that there is a time, it's usually called sinning away your day of grace. You ever heard that phrase? That if you just rebel against God, there's going to come a day where God says, fine, forget it. Now, in Romans 1, to the pagan, that's exactly what happens. There comes a time in Romans where God says, I gave them over to their own wishes, their own heart. There's no, there's no more sadder phrase in all the world than God gave them over for what they wanted. And that's what he does to the unbelieving pagan. But that is not what he does to his children. I don't believe we can sin away. You know what happens to us? The first time we say no to God in some area, we, if, we usually struggle with it. But the second time it becomes easier and easier and easier. And the problem is not that God leaves us. The problem is that we begin to leave God. It's our part of the covenant that's being affected. It's not that God ceases to love. It's not that God ceases to be present. It's not that God ceases to forgive. It's that we don't believe he can do that to someone like us. The, the, the communication has been blocked from our side because we've continued to say no and no. And I want to say this to you as strongly as I know how. If God's convicted you of a personal sin, whatever it is, and you cherish that sin and hide that sin and just continue to do that, no matter what else you do for the cause or the kingdom, I want to tell you that that unconfessed known sin continuing the life of a Christian will rob you of joy, of peace, and rob you of assurance, and rob you of effective ministry. And there's no way around that. We're not playing games here. If there's something in your life that you know is not pleasing to God, you need to deal with it. You say, well, Baba, it's been a problem I've had all my life. I don't think God is concerned that we can totally quit sinning. I think he is concerned that we don't compromise with our sin nature or with the world. The fact that we're still in the struggle is often the victory that we're going to have. This is not talking about God will just say, fine, forget it. I like that English poem called The Hound of Heaven. It sounds kind of gross to call God a bloodhound. But the truth is, he is on the trail of lost men. And whenever they'll turn around, for whatever reason, they'll find God tapping on the back saying, I love you. I died for you. I want you to know me. My goodness, we have a God that will not leave us alone. He will not, he will not take his love away. The reason I know that, look at verse 8 and look at verse, uh, the rest of verse 9. I mean, it, it negates what is often said about this verse. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Now, what this means is God gets ticked. I mean, it bothers God what we do. It bothers God we hurt each other. It bothers God we destroy his world. It bothers God the way we act. I, you know, it, it, I grew up in a divorced home, and so I didn't, I didn't have a, 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 a father that I knew until much later in my life. And relating to God as father was very difficult to me until I began to have children. Then suddenly it dawned on me. I thought God was mad at me. I grew up afraid of God because of these stinking, nitpicking rules that Baptists have. We don't spit, dance, or chew or go with those who do. Great. That'll get you to heaven. You know, yuck. Thinking God was just up there marking off. Oh, boy, I can't wait to see you. Look what all you did. Boy, my attitudes changed. When I had a child, I began to realize that if they had a need, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help them, even if they cry and throw a fit. The two examples I just love to tell, my daughter, we bought her a big wheel. Remember those big things, little tracks? 
And she would run down our driveway and across the street and up the other driveway. The only problem is we lived on a street in Lubbock that went to the mall. And so you try to explain to this little girl, little girl, big car, you know, but you can't. They can't see you. Don't ride in the street. Well, she still did it. So I say to her, Michelle, if you ride it in the street, I'm going to spank you. Think she stopped? Croak, no. I can remember Peggy saying to me, Oh, Bob, don't hit her. You're going to put little marks on her. I'm going to mark her, and I'll tell you why. I'd rather her be afraid of me than die in the street. I'm willing to hurt somebody I love because there's an area they're going to die in. That's what God does to you. You thought it was anger. You thought it was meanness. You thought it was God trying to kill your fun. And it was your heavenly father saying, this will kill you. You can't go in this area. This is not for you. I'm sure your kids have played this game. Oh, they, first of all, they stayed up all night because I heard the TV on. Then the next morning, they had this sudden illness. They can't go to school. Remember this little, little game? Oh, Dad, I really feel bad. Well, whatever we, we learned, if we said, fine, we'll call the doctor. Now, when my kids hear doctor, they see needles that long that they always put in their eyes or something, you know. Instantaneous cure. Oh, I feel better. <laughs> but you know, there have been times that my children had to have stitches or whatever. Now, I'm willing to hold them on the table for a few moments of pain because I know they won't be scarred for life. Now, they're begging and screaming and making all kind of deals. I know that this short pain is better than long-term problems. They're going to get the stitches. I don't care what they do. I don't care how much they beg. Don't you know God is dealing with you that way? You think he's just out to, to kill your joy? hurt your fun, take away your privileges, pick on you. We've got a sick view of God. I, I see this when students come to me and say, you know, I want to give my life to God, but I know if I do, he'll send me to outer Mongolia to eat roaches or something, you know. We're afraid if we give our life to God, he'll make us do what we're afraid of or send us someplace we don't want to go, and that truly reveals what we think about God. My understanding of God as a loving parent has changed my whole understanding of the Christian life. What I now see as his hand of discipline, by the way, Hebrews 12, 5 and following says, if he doesn't discipline you, you're not one of his children. It's parental love. It's care. It's, it, it's love for our best that, that God acts in our lives, and we have totally misunderstood it. He has not dealt with us according to our sin or rewarded us according to our iniquities. Look at verse 14. He himself knows our frame. He is mindful we are but dust. Loosen up a little bit. <laughs> Get off of your own case. You need to learn how to laugh. You're not that hot. Sorry. <laughs> it just doesn't revolve around you. I hate to tell you that. The world just doesn't revolve around you. You're really kind of a turkey, to tell you the truth. All of you. And if you just get, quit being so serious about yourself, you may enjoy life a little more. God obviously enjoys making funny people look around. <laughs> Come on. We walk with him. We love him. We try to follow his will the best we know. We live by faith. We make mistakes. God is for us. He's for us. He's not against us. He's for us. He's with us. He loves us. He will not let us go. It'll change your whole worldview. Change, change how you do religion. I can remember as a young Baptist preacher doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this to try to earn God's love, but the problem is the faster I ran, I never could run fast enough. And I remember the day, it wasn't audible, I don't have those kind of things, but I remember the day God spoke to my heart and said, Bob, I love you because of who I am, not because of who you are. I love you because of what Christ did, not because of what you do or don't do. Now, I still do all the things I used to do, but now I do them out of an overwhelming sense of gratitude for a God who loves me like that and not out of a performance-based merit religion. Changed my whole view of life. I can laugh in this pulpit, and I will and do and love it. It's fun to be a Christian. Hallelujah. It's not a sour pickle contest. There should be an amen there, dadgum. Now, uh, 
It's always amazed me. In verses 15 through 18, it talks about that God is eternal and we're not. You know, I, I pastored in Lubbock about 10 years, and it used to, it's just dry out there, just sandy. And a thunderstorm will come over, and suddenly wildflowers will sprout, and a field that looked just barren, thousands of wildflowers come up. And they last about two weeks. In that two weeks, they, they, they bloom, they seed, and they're gone. They're gone. Your life is like that. You think your great-great-grandchildren, if the Lord doesn't come back, are going to know who you are? Do you know your great-great-grandparents, what they did, were they, anything about them at all? We're here just for a moment. All we have is the now. God's eternal. We're transient. We need to live for Him and put our hope in Him. Nothing's going to last except what's in God. Nothing. Then this psalm closes with everything in creation. Praise God. Oh, my Bless the Lord, you angels. Uh, bless the Lord, you host. Uh, bless the Lord, all you works. Oh, I think every time I hear that, I remember that song, Ain't No Rock Gonna Cry Out For Me. <laughs> Rocks are going to praise Him. Trees are going to praise Him. Oh, I look forward to that day. In all places of His dominion, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Will you bow your head me for a minute? Can you thank Him this morning for something in your life? What, what do you want to say, God, I just want to stop for a moment and thank you for blank. What do you want to praise God for? What has he done for you? What's he doing in your life? Forgiveness, for joy, for purpose, for inner peace, for assurance. What, what are you rejoicing this morning? Thank him for that. Talk to him. God, thank you. Now, what, what's that skeleton in the closet? Where is that black hole in your heart? Who is that you're mad at? What is that you're mad at? When is that you're mad at? What is bothering you about the past? What is, a, what is, is terrifying you about tomorrow? The God who wants your praise is the God who wants your pain. The God who gives you assurance is the God who can handle your fear. Can you tell him, I'm really upset about blank. I really worry about blank. I really sense a need in the area of blank. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Our Father, thank you for loving us as, as a father does his children. Thank you that your love is not conditioned on our performance, but conditioned on your character. God, we've done such dumb things. We, we just make the poorest choices. But you're with us and you're for us. And there's a day and there's tomorrow. And thank you for forgiving and forgetting. Thank you for a personal spiritual gift for every one of your children. Thank you for a place in your church. Thank you for something that no one else can really do for you as effectively. Thank you for the fellowship of family and friends and church. And thank you for the sense of peace that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that even amidst the problems, you're going to help us grow stronger. In the midst of personal need, you're always there to say, I love you. I want you to know me. In Jesus' name.